In this class we're going to look at global business. Now global business is not new. It's been around for centuries, almost from the start of time. It's been around for millennia. People have traded right throughout history. We talk about global business now as if it's a recent phenomenon, but it's not. It's been around right from the start. Lured by the prospects of large markets and our sources of raw materials, businesses have traded with uh, other parts of the world, as I said, right throughout history. And there are records going back many, many centuries. But as we'll see, uh, global business and global industry is different. Th these are different concepts. So we need to distinguish them and we also need to look at some of the characteristics of modern international business and the underlying forces. Why it's apparently suddenly accelerated in importance. Why is it now increasingly important to us? Let's start by looking at the ANSOF matrix, uh, a technique which has cropped up in other videos, but let's go back and look at it again. The, the matrix is simply um, looking at existing products and new products, existing markets and new markets, and filling in uh, different terms and different situations associated with the intersection of each of these. So for example, existing products going into existing markets is called market penetration. Existing products going into new markets is market development. It's the existing pro uh, products going into new markets, so the market is being developed. When we have existing markets and new products, it's called product development. And new products and new markets is called diversification. So we have this way of looking at um, expansions into other markets. Now international business and uh, the context of ANSOF, ANSOF's uh, matrix. Um, entry into overseas markets represents market development. Existing products are sold in new markets. So companies who have researched and developed and brought out products in the domestic market and who have tried and tested the products and have refined the technology and the skills to produce the products to expand their market and to get a greater return on the investment they made in terms of capital, training, research and development. In order to get a bigger return they expand into other markets so it's called market development. Now it's appealing because market penetration is difficult in saturated markets. When markets are full and highly competitive and there are many products competing for uh, let's say consumers incomes it's difficult to expand. It's difficult to penetrate the market. Product development is costly that's uh, introducing a new product into an existing market. Diversification is, is risky itself. That's a new product into a new market completely. So product development is a new, a new product into an existing market. Diversification is, is quite radical. It's getting a new product and launching it into a new market. So it's inherent uh, with risk. There, there's risk right throughout that whole process and that makes it a very risky thing to do. So why enter overseas markets? Well the reason for entering overseas markets can be categorized into push and pull factors. Some factors push companies into overseas markets. They, they, they have to move into the overseas markets. Others are pulled in because they're attracted in to it. Let's have a look at and see what we mean by push and pull in a little more detail. Um, first of all, push factors. Well, 
for a start, saturation in the domestic market. When the domestic market is, as I said, fully exploited, there are many competitors producing essentially the same products. They're fighting for uh, perhaps quite a small market. Um, it's extremely competitive. The market is really saturated. Now, that means some companies will be pushed into looking for other markets. They might be pushed overseas to look at markets overseas. There may be uh, economic difficulty in domestic markets. It could be that domestic markets are dipping because, let's say, the government has cut back government expenditure because of some macroeconomic issue. Uh, so there's higher and increasing rates of unemployment. People are less able to buy the products. There's falling incomes. Uh, so economic difficulty, and this may push companies again to look for markets overseas. It could also be the case that the product is at the end or near the end of its product life cycle. So what it, the company can do is perhaps go into um, a new market overseas where the product is, is new into the market and therefore is at the starting point of its product life cycle, not the end. So a product may be towards the end of its product life cycle in one country, but perhaps just at the start at another. So there's an extra lease of life for the product. Sometimes companies have excess capacity. In other words, they have expanded, they have plenty of capital, they've expanded their their worker base, they have expanded the, their premises, they have excess capacity perhaps. And if the market is declining domestically, they'll find that they have ever-increasing excess capacity. So one way of exploiting the, ex, uh, the excess capacity is to expand into overseas markets. And of course, it's a good way to diversify risk, to, uh, to to share the risk in a sense. If the domestic market is encountering some issues with extreme competition or new competitors or new trends or whatever, the survival of the of the business may become risky. There may be a question mark over the survival of the business. But operating in a different country simultaneously means the risk is not as much as before. It may dip in one country, but the other country may, may survive and may, may do well. So in order for companies to survive and to diversify the risk, perhaps opening in other countries may be a good idea. So those are some of the, the push factors we can identify with uh, this process of global business, moving uh, a company's presence into another country. Now the pull factors. Well, for a start, overseas markets may be seen as attractive. Overseas markets may be expanding and uh, they may be becoming more attractive. If we think about China today, compared to, say, China in the 1970s or the 1980s. Uh, China today is a very sophisticated society. A lot of consumer uh, expenditure available in China, a large market, um, customers eager to see new products and to try out new, new products. and So that becomes an attractive market. So there should be increased sales as a consequence of this. Um, expanding into another market, there's increased sales. The company experiences more sales, which is really what the company is about, making sales and generating profits. Of course, in expanding in this way, the company will gain economies of scale. Economies of scale means economies of size. As companies grow, the the average cost of production tends to fall. And the reason for that is, is simple. Uh, as companies grow, they become, uh, it gets 
it gets easier for them to negotiate discounts on bulk buying of raw materials they're able to have specialist machinery built to make the product um, so the, the product is very efficiently made they're able to hire specialist, uh, specialist personnel within specialist departments engage in more research and development in other words as companies grow costs, average costs tend to fall I have to say here as well that of course some companies may get too big in which case there are what's known as diseconomies of size, diseconomies of scale and those are associated with trying to control large businesses as I said earlier the, the pull factors may be to extend the product life cycle we met this in the push factors earlier um, it could be that products um, are nearing the end of their product life cycle and therefore companies wishing to extend the product life cycle ten, uh, trying to ex uh, extend the period of time left in the product may wish to expand into other countries and if the company has got a competitive advantage let's say specialist know-how or um, a very good research and development team who are developing products that meet customer needs and expectations if it has got that then perhaps it wants to exploit that as quickly as possible and make as much from that advantage before other companies start to, to develop similar processes and, and start to work in similar ways so the company may expand into overseas markets to try and make as much as possible uh, out of their advantage could just be personal ambition of course on the part of the owners who want to be seen to be involved in a, a global business and who want to have a global business so it could be just simply uh, personal ambition now factors in the choice uh, of, of which overseas market to enter well the size of the market will certainly be important and of course as will the income levels some societies may be very large but the income levels, the average income levels may be quite small so it's looking at the population and looking at disposable income within that society which may determine the choice of a particular country to expand into. Economic factors as well, very important. The state of the economy. What is government policy? Uh, is it right-wing, left-wing? Is it libertarian? Is it interventionist? What sort of government is it? How stable is the government? And what are the, the factors, the economic factors in play in that country? Is the country expanding, going through a rapid growth rate? is it uh, highly controlled or is it bureaucratic what are the factors taking the totality of these trying, trying to take as many as possible into account and looking at the the pros and cons of each there are of course of course um, cultural linguistic factors and companies try to find countries that they can do business in easily uh, it's very difficult to trade in countries where there is a, a big jump in culture and a big issue about language and understanding. So there are issues about um, being able to conduct business there and what are the number of, let's say, English-speaking uh, people available to work in the business, who would want to work in the business, um, how many interpreters and, and so on so there are issues about uh, culture and linguistic considerations that need to be taken into account as I said earlier political stability is a problem some countries may not be that stable they may have elections very irregularly they may have no elections at all they may, it may be run by the army or it may be run by um, some 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 family or, or some dictator from the past it all depends so what is the political stability what's the legal framework what sort of protection do people and businesses receive in the country and that may be important 
there are also issues like technological factors. Uh, technological factors could be communication systems, the existence of the internet, the uh, presence of a reliable source of power, for example electricity. In some societies electricity may be cut off for many hours a day. And it also depends on the, the climate, of course. What's the, the temperature in the country? If it's very hot and there's no power for air conditioning, it can be a very difficult place to work and very difficult to get people with skills and expertise to go there and, and spend some time there working. So there are many factors that influence the choice of location. Now, constraints and difficulties in entering overseas markets. Well, obviously resources will be a big problem. Can the company afford to expand into another country? Can it afford to um, to make this expansion? It, it, it's not an easy thing to do. It is a very expensive thing to do, in fact. And the company will have to have retained profits or ask for its shareholders, perhaps, if it's a limited company, ask its shareholders to invest more to finance the expansion. It also takes time to uh, enter overseas markets. It's not an instantane instantaneous thing. A lot of research has to be done into the state of the market, the, the state of the political uh, situation in the country, the stability of the economy, and so on. But also, the bureaucracy involved. How long does it take to get permission to move there and uh, where will the business be located and finding premises? It's a time-consuming exercise and that may be uh, a real issue. There could also be market uncertainty that the market may be volatile in that country or the leadership uh, the political leadership in the country is volatile. There are many issues uh, associated with, with moving to another country that uh, may not be obvious uh, in, in terms of a, a brief look at the country, but a look in more detail may expose market uncertainties and issues about the state of the economy and the future course of that economy. Of course there are marketing costs. Having gone through all of the issues that we've just discussed and now uh, been given the green light to establish in another country, the issue of marketing arises. What's the best marketing plan and the best marketing tactic in order to expand into that market? Um, again, extremely expensive and also requires a lot of research before a decision can be made. But not something that can be just done very quickly. This is uh, something that takes time and care. Also looking at the cultural differences we mentioned earlier, um, knowing how to trade in that country may be a problem. Um, maybe the, uh, the staff who look after um, the marketing the staff who look after the, um, the the administration of the business, perhaps they have to be trained uh, to look into cultural differences and understand what is acceptable and not acceptable in that country. I mentioned also earlier linguistic differences. That is a cost. It's a cost to have precise translations done so that there are no ambiguities and no misunderstandings. This is particularly important in the context of drawing up contracts and trading. It may also be the case that there are trade barriers between the domestic market and the market that's been anticipated overseas. Um, governments and countries do have trade barriers. They're less important in many respects between many countries. There's a greater movement for liberalization of trade globally and the obstacles for trade are being reduced. 
but they may still linger and one of the issues uh, that may confront people trading may not be perhaps explicit tariffs or quotas on trade but there may be bureaucratic obstacles to trade bureaucratic obstacles bringing uh, raw materials or bringing products into a country and getting them cleared through customs that may be an issue um, also regulations and administrative procedures may also be a problem that running a company in some countries may have to uh, deal with many regulations and administrative procedures which may seem again bureaucratic or, or not necessary but it's a part of the if you like the business culture of that country and uh, companies aiming to set up overseas will just have, simply have to encounter these and deal with them but they may be seen as um, additional costs that have to be taken into account I mentioned political uncertainties but uh, that can affect inward investment it can in, uh, affect the state of the economy um, it can affect the state of the market so companies investing overseas must take that into account uh, otherwise they may be investing and getting a very low return on the investment exchange rates may be a problem um, if nothing else just getting uh, getting foreign currency and ex uh, transaction costs and risks of exchange rate movements these are problems uh, that the company will have to deal with um, it is possible to buy currency forward to reduce the risk but th it's still a situation where exchange rates may move up move down and depending on the state of trade the state of the economy the state of the interest rates and, and even government pronouncements so it's an additional risk involved in setting up overseas financing overseas in uh, investment is a problem because investors may be reluctant to invest in societies that they don't know very well and particularly if they, that society is seen as a little unstable or or perhaps their procedures are too difficult uh, too different or, or even radically different to what they're used to so getting finance for the project may be an issue working capital problems uh, may be an issue trying to get raw materials and trying to get work in progress and efficient stock management and distribution networks trying to get all of this established can be an issue as well um, simply setting up overseas if the company needs raw materials perhaps specialist raw materials or components that have to be imported from the original company if you like back home if if the company overseas needs those there may be problems with as I said exchange rates um, administrative procedures and so on so working capital could be a problem sometimes it's difficult to get insurance in some societies so there may be an issue of getting insurance um, insurance to try and secure the, the capital and secure liability in the event of accidents or issues that, that may arise in the future so sometimes insurance businesses are not that well developed in other societies and as I just mentioned distribution networks may be a problem as well um, trying to get the product to market from the company the new company established overseas may be an issue uh, logistical systems may not be well developed distribution systems may not be well developed um, warehousing retailers uh, access to markets in general these are all issues that need to be considered carefully before any investment overseas takes place we normally think of overseas trade in terms of exporting and importing 
of goods and services. This involves transporting goods and selling them across national boundaries. It's the way we normally think of international trade, transporting goods and selling them across national boundaries. Direct exporting implies that the domestic firm is actively involved in selling the goods abroad. So that is direct exporting, selling goods abroad, across national boundaries. Indirect exporting means that the marketing of goods is delegated to export agents and the UK manufacturer concentrates on production. So we have two types here when we think of international trade and we're going down the exporting route, not necessarily establishing in another country. Um, here we have two. We have exporting, direct exporting, that's selling the products directly overseas, or indirect exporting where um, the problems are in a sense delegated to an export agent who has expert knowledge of that country and of the procedures, rules, regulations and so on, the culture, the language and so on. So the export agent undertakes selling in that country and the UK manufacturer or the domestic manufacturer concentrates on production. But exporting involves the movement of goods uh, is only one method of engaging in international trade. There are other forms of uh, dealing with um, international trade. So other methods of market entry. Well, overseas product and or assembly, producing the goods abroad, that's a possibility. Setting up a company over there and selling it and selling the product and making the product abroad. Could be international alliances and joint ventures working with foreign companies, trying to find companies overseas who make similar products, who are interested in the same type of market and, and trying to form an alliance or some sort of joint venture with those companies to try and uh, get a presence in the overseas markets. There could be international mergers and acquisitions across frontiers. Um, it does happen that companies buy up other companies in, in other countries and, and use those as a platform into that country. And in fact there are many international companies we can think of. Sony for example, um, but also many um, cosmetic brands, um, many, many products may have overseas production in many countries and, and sell into markets overseas. So it has happened and it's continuing. It is difficult but larger companies can afford the research and development, they can afford the research into the market as well, they can afford expert advice and so on. So it does happen. International franchising and licensing allows foreign based uh, firms to produce market and distribute goods in specified areas abroad. So sometimes international marketing and licensing allow foreign firms to produce the goods and market and distribute the goods abroad. So um, there are many companies that, that rely on the franchising model. McDonald's for example. Um, many high street uh, stores have presence in other countries through fran franchising arrangements. So in this session we've looked at some of the issues involved in global business and some of the background problems associated with global business. So we, we know the advantages, we, we've talked about those and now we've had a, a, a more detailed insight into some of the problems. And that's all we're going to deal with in this session, so I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching.